nearby concepts like uh, William Fawcett's life cycle options or Erwin uh, Ed's better polyvalence for allocating the producers or change readiness by Finch to answer more thoroughly to changing needs. Furthermore, and quoting once more the OECD, uh, OECD considers today to be exemplary facilities that are respons responsive to curriculum changes as you can see on this quote. So adaptability is therefore a very significant re requirement for school to continue to pursue and to potentiate the evolving learning model crucial for today's framework. In fact, both physical and psychological features are recognized as proven catalysts for the learning process. So therefore, pedagogical developments in school curricula today uh, and in the learning process, along with social changes from the profiles of the student, student community, from the educators, from the students themselves, from the parents, besides the ongoing technological achievements we also have today, all reply, imply rethinking the learning process and also the learning spaces. Besides, this contemporary learning paradigm implies not only a reconsideration of the traditional classroom you can see here, but also of the overall school space, acknowledging a lot of spaces as other active learning environments that enrich pathways by providing opportunities for creative interaction. You can see in the second image a much more current paradigm of the school space. And I'm putting here in Washington, providing <coughs> opportunities for creative interaction. So overall, the contemporary learning experience contemplates both formal and informal activities occurring in formal and informal spaces. So activities such as group work, formal classes, group presentations, evaluations moments, general conferences, as you can see here, besides social socialization and peer interaction, they all represent moments of a thorough learning experience. And so, uh, these, all these activities, all, all these experiences have to be accounted for in the existing and in the future educational buildings. So accordingly, adaptable learning spaces accommodate a more extensive range of activities and a more extensive range of users, which are able to cope with curricular, technological and social changes in the long run by lessening the frequency of interventions in the built object through its pre-perceived provision in the design. It has been thought previously in the design. So as suggested, if the learning experience takes place in distinct spaces, this methodology that I will explain here will also consider a crossing of methods in order to deliver quantitative and qualitative information on both spaces formal and informal features. Consequently, this hybrid methodology aims to assess adaptability of the learning environments by three distinct approaches. So first, a space syntax approach, uh, which analyzes the building's morphology. Then, entropy calculations by means of a mathematical formulation. And lastly, the use of qualitative methods, such as observation matrices, walkthroughs, focus groups, for better understanding spatial experience and appropriation. It will then display conclusions based on the outcomes of each stage and after proceeding with the methodology on educational, educational spaces can be analyzed, assessed and even ranked according to the possibility of allocating different activities, different users, ultimately concluding on each space's adaptability potential. So just to contextualize this presented methodology, uh, it has been originally created from scratch under my PhD research, uh, which inevitably holds a deeper complexity and detail. So and it also has a case study for more complete explanation. And nevertheless, for this paper, I will try to explain all the stages and the results presented, of course, assuming a simplification of both the stages and the results. Uh, this paper aims to provide an overall portrayal of the full methodology and how it potentially reaches a more robust conclusion.
inclusion by gathering distinct academic established areas in order to answer definite research questions for both the theory and the practice in architecture. So, the case study, so specifically this methodology has been applied to Kinder de Spor School, which is a school in Coimbra. You can see here the red dot in Coimbra's Google Earth view. And you can see, uh, zooming in on the school, today, this school is a basic, secondary and music school that uh, originally started in 1968 and went through a modernization process in 2008 under the scope of the overall program of modernization of the secondary schools. So for this school particularly, uh, this uh, modernization process had the specificity of introducing the artistic teaching of both music and dancing in this school in 2008, besides the regular teaching. So clearly, spatial requirements became much more extensive. So this, for this paper, specifically, the analysis will be undertaken just in the new building from 2008, which is a building in grey, you can see here. So in 68, the, the school had a scattered building layout, and then this uh, grey building was built in 2008. This new building is much more representative of activity and user mix. So uh, for the application under this case study, it, it could be much more representative and significant. So the first approach, space syntax. Of course, I have to start with a quote from Bill Elliott and Julie Nansen. And this quote much represents the, the bond between space and society. And in fact, um, according to its spatial properties, the school, um, in relation to spaces, promotes social relations, stimulates encounters, patterns of movement, co-presence, considering it to be an educational tool. Quoting Fredegor, which is also another of my research advisors. So, therefore, a space index analysis plays a critical role as it focuses on spatial morphology and the concepts of integration, connectivity, depth, visibility, and ultimately intelligibility. This will provide conclusions on the implications of spatial placement towards patterns of natural movement and activities users clusters. Moreover, while considering that the learning occurs both in individual spaces and amongst pathways, there are also, means, are also means for communication, interaction, learning. Uh, axial lines cross several spaces, and axial lines are much, as you've you seen from the previous papers, much uh, supported by space syntax. So, the analysis of axial lines being further data for this research, as it refers to potential activities in sequences of natural movement that hold pedagogical potential. Therefore, this method will undertake convex spaces as individual entities, as well as topological relation of spaces by axial lines. The global and synthetic properties will be evaluated in charts and graphs provided from the software and then imported to depth map X. The crossing of both results will provide a broader outlook on the patterns of co-presence in both moving and static activities, moving by axial lines and static activities in convex spaces. This has been applied to the plans of Kinder Schloor School, concluding that the most integrated space on the ground floor is the main hall you can see here in the photo, which welcomes all users, whereas on the upper floor it is also the main corridor which is the, the most integrated. That you can clearly see in the map, uh, as you know, and as before in the previous papers, uh, the red means the highest integration from the traditional color scheme from that map. So afterwards, intelligibility scattergrams can be provided, can be produced as a second order measure, it can be achieved by correlating integration and connectivity and understanding which floor's layout is best comprehended and understood. In this case, it was the ground floor's Excel line map that has the higher levels of intelligibility. And this is fairly significant because it is this tool that is an interface between visitors and inhabitants, as the earlier also defined. 
So, subsequently, approach number two, entropy calculations. So, entropy at each stage will be calculated uh, by means of a mathematical formulation defined by Shannon, later studied by James and Travis. James considers entropy uh, and uncertainty as synonyms, which can be transferable for this case study as the uncertainty of an activity allocation to a space. This ultimately implies that the higher entropy space has a higher range of potential activity allocations. And the studies of William Fawcett represent the benchmark on the state of the art of this approach, calculating adaptability as a numerical value and correlating uh, adaptability and entropy. The process of calculating entropy has been done, as you can see, by a, a sequential production of matrices and calculations, and ultimately using the formulation by Shannon applied to each space that presented an entropy figure for each space that you can see here. Uh, the paralleling of both approaches, space syntax and an entropy approach, may also conclude on the relevance of these variables towards adaptability, towards actual use of a particular space, and also conclude on the effective or full usage at that, at that stage at, at this point. So for this case study, you can see here the entropy rank of all convex spaces. The highest entropy spaces are spaces that hold several features that allow them to allocate a wider range of activities. So you have, for instance, the library, the orchestra room, you can see here also the music studio, the auditorium, and also generic spaces. On the contrary, the spaces ranked with the lowest entropy values here highlighted in grey are strictly monofunctional and, and support effective learning environments. Consequently, this methodology, supported by the studies on adaptability, representative of the state of the art, but critically projects them onto the current learning paradigm of today. So, once more following Erzberger's concept of the learning street, another novelty introduced here and under my PhD research, it's the analysis of adaptability uh, under a broader definition. So, after the analysis of convex spaces uh, by entropy calculations, as you saw here. Also, axial lines will be understood here with the entropy calculations. So, I studied convex spaces and axial lines for both space syntax and also for entropy calculations. So, for this, I had to uh, understand two new concepts. Uh, that uh, connected axial lines with entropy that weren't, uh, weren't referred in literature. So, a novelty here introduced by this doctoral research are these new, new, two new concepts, axial line entropy and average axial line entropy. And this was uh, just presented this last July in the Fund International Space Syntax Symposium in London. Uh, focus particularly on the relation between entropy and space syntax and on these two concepts uh, in a paper by me and Professor Marie Kuhn. So, after calculating the entropy of each individual space, the axial lines have also had their entropy calculated. The end conclusion is that that axial line entropy is a product of the individual space's entropy that each axial line intersects and varies accordingly. So the last procedure, the last approach, it focuses on effective occupancy, having further information on spontaneous and unprogrammed activities not referred in the previous sample. So assuming that each method will provide different conclusions, for this methodology, we will focus on observation matrices, uh, walkthroughs, and focus groups for the speaking individual experience and appropriation. So first, observation matrices aim to recognize patterns of movement and use and identify invariables and fluctuations in those patterns. They comprise a report on the nature and the density in a specific time period and repeat it repeatedly in several intervals during a whole day. 
For this school, it was found relevant to choose the most significant time periods, such as the morning arrival, the lunch break, or the evening exit. And as well as specific observation dates, such as a regular school day, uh, examinations phase, a vacation break, or a community event day, such as today, for instance. Walkthroughs. Walkthroughs are repeatedly done with assorted focus groups, each with a common denominator. So for this group, uh, walkthroughs uh, were preceded with students and educators from the regular teaching, students and educators from the artistic teaching, and school staff, of course. This procedure, this procedure aims to recognize how people move and act in space, and what are the main pathways each focus group chooses that can be particularly significant, specifically in an artistic school. Lastly, focus groups. So afterwards, one person from each previous focus group identified and asked very detailed questions to have information on specific situations recognized in previous walkthroughs. So focus groups are done in the, in the, the manner and the form of recorded interviews with a critical subsequent analysis. And the detail of those questions is chosen according to the purposes of that research. It's quite different from inquiries. For this case study, the focus groups consist of a set of students and a set of educators. So this demonstrates that special experience varies very much according to the profile of the community analyzed. You can see here different uses, different experience of the spaces, from formal artistic displays in formal spaces, to rehearsals in the classrooms, to informal artistic displays, very often in informal spaces and also very often as non-programmed activities. So, um, as you can see, this school much enables appropriation, as Ed Sperber uh, defined it, uh, which is quite significant for a creative artistic teaching community when experiencing the space. So, conclusions. The final output of this research aims to display an insightful outlook of the possibility of analyzing an educational space by several procedures, but foremost to demonstrate its relevance and its originality when used within a hybrid methodology. Besides, by assuming the specificity of today's active learning environments, whose configuration can vary very widely, it has been considered to analyze the school not only by its convex spaces, uh, but also as the pathways, as possibilities for learning. So, the relevance of this methodology also lies in the correlation between convex spaces and axial lines within a space syntax and an entropy approach, followed by a comprehensive analysis of their potential correlation. For a practical application, it has been applied to a case study with a higher need for spatial adaptability. Generally, spaces with recognizable values of entropy also represent spaces with some of the most integrated and connected values on space syntax, which is most significant uh, proving this potential correlation, such as the library and the main hall, which are respectively the spaces with high entropy and high integration. supports a potential correlation between activity allocation, integration and appropriation, and ultimately towards adaptability. Furthermore, other spaces identified with significant values of entropy, such as the orchestra room or the dance studio, are intersected by the most integrated axial line of that floor, presenting a strong correlation between synthetic integration and entropy. Then, scattergrams of reduced correlating uh, space syntax integration and entropy calculations for both convex spaces and axial lines. This led to distinct results. Specifically, for this case study, which could differ from when applied to other case studies, the correlation between axial lines has proven to be much stronger. 
As you can see in the scattergram, the, the regression lines and the determination coefficients of this scattergram pointed out that it is on the ground floor when analyzed blue axial lines that it holds the highest correspondence, which is also the space, as you saw before, with the highest intelligibility. This confirms a higher possibility of spaces with high entropy, such as the main hall, to be experienced by users in various ways and highlights the relevance of informality, particularly for the school's curricula and students. <coughs> Finally, and recognizing the importance of educational spaces towards learning, this paper concludes on the potential correspondence between spatial morphology, high entropy levels regarding actual spatial usage and building performance. The outcomes provide in-depth data on the potential overlapping of attributes spaces and activities towards adaptability, whose input can inform future projects and design strategies uh, that will affect the building's occupancy, ability to cope with change, and overall life cycle.